In L.A. this week, new leadership at the LAFD meet the man handpicked by the mayor to overhaul the embattled fire department. You may recognize this bridge from movies and commercials. I'm Rasha Goel. Up next, why this iconic bridge is being demolished. A popular rock band's downtown mural will remain thanks to efforts from L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti. But how long can it stay up? That remains to be seen because it may violate city laws. I'm Gil Reyes with a story next. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. After a nationwide search for a replacement for former LAFD Chief Brian Cummings, who stepped down in October, the city welcomes its new chief during a tumultuous time for the fire department. Rasha Goel has more. After what Mayor Eric Garcetti calls an exhaustive nationwide search, he has finally selected a 30-year LA City Fire Department veteran to head the Los Angeles Fire Department. The LAFD has faced criticism in recent years for problems with misrepresenting emergency response times and, in recent months, for its recruitment and hiring practices. I have decided there is no better person to cut response times, to improve technology in this department, and to bring reform to the Los Angeles Fire Department than Chief Ralph Terrazas. Ralph Terrazas is a Los Angeles native who grew up in Wilmington. He was recently a top commander overseeing fire responses in the southern section of the city. I want to fight with the mayor to reform the fire department. So mayor, thank you. Thank you for selecting me as your next fire chief. But more importantly, thank you for selecting an internal member from your choice of many qualified candidates. Now, the mayor is counting on Terrazas to help overhaul the department's hiring practices in order to bring diversity to the department's ranks, among other priorities. The mayor says he is confident the new chief will be able to begin turning the department around. Some of the accomplishments that give me confidence in his ability to lead and innovate are his current leadership in the Emergency Services Bureau, where he commands 54 fire stations, which followed his creation and leadership of the Professional Standards Division, where he gained experience with ethics, reform, and labor relations. According to the mayor, Terrazas is the first Latino in the department's history to lead the department. He is also the 18th person to serve as chief. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. Chief Terrazas will officially take over the LAFD starting August. As federal lawmakers continue to come up with comprehensive immigration reform here at the local level, the mayor and the Los Angeles Police Department have taken a firm stand, letting immigration officials know the city is no longer performing duties, it says, should be done by federal officials. Mayor Eric Garcetti, joined by LAPD Chief Charlie Beck, City Attorney Mike Fuhr, and Council Members Curran Price and Gil Cedillo, announced on the steps of City Hall that the Los Angeles Police Department will no longer honor immigration detainer requests submitted by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, unless there is a warrant issued. The federal government is in charge of enforcing federal immigration laws, not us at the local level and that responsibility can't be forced onto local law enforcement officials who already have stretched budgets. To those concerned about how this may impact crime in Los Angeles, Chief Beck had this to say. We have systematically reduced the number of ICE detentions that we honored over the last three years. First through department policy and then through state legislation. And during that time, crime has continued to fall in Los Angeles. And Mayor Garcetti added that, that with municipalities the across the country stretched thin and strapped for funding, the LAPD's priorities are to fight gangs and drugs and guns. A farmer's market that was considered wildly successful over opening weekend may already be headed for a downfall. It's going to take more than public demand to keep this particular market running. Rasha Goel explains why. A judge recently granted a temporary restraining order prohibiting the operation of a medical marijuana farmer's market in Boyle Heights. The California Heritage Market, operated by the West Coast Collective, opened for business over the 4th of July weekend, giving customers the opportunity to meet directly with pot growers. But for now, it's stuff. all been halted. Uh, the court was very clear. Uh, there can be no multiple vendors selling at this site, only bona fide employees. 
there could be no stalls or booths. There can be no advertising of farmer's market. L.A. City Attorney Mike Fuhrer has been in favor of the closure, saying it violates Proposition D, which limits the number of legal dispensaries allowed in the city. He also says the medical marijuana farmer's market is an unauthorized and unpermitted use of property on Esperanza Street. There should be access to people who have cancer and other serious illnesses to medical marijuana to alleviate their suffering, their pain. But the voters said through Prop D there are too many dispensaries. They're too close together. They're too close to sensitive sites. And there are other rules that ought to be in place. Representatives for the West Coast Collective argue that this farmer's market cuts out the middleman and allows patients to meet cultivators directly, allowing them to address questions and concerns, sometimes which the shopkeepers are unable to answer. A hearing is scheduled August 6 to determine whether the farmer's market will be permanently closed. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. And in This Week in Tweets, First Lady Michelle Obama was in Los Angeles to attend and speak at the Unite for Veterans Summit. The summit held at the Hyatt Regency Century Plaza focused on employment and housing for veterans. Mayor Eric Garcetti was also in attendance. Mrs. Obama's Instagram account posted this photo of the two sharing a lighthearted moment, captioned, Thank you for your leadership. First Lady of the United States on the commitment by Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti and the LA Mayor's Office to end veteran homelessness. Hashtag United for Vets. The same photo was retweeted on the Twitter account of the LA Mayor's Office. The mayor also tweeted, I'm eager to take on the challenge to end veteran homelessness in LA. So our 150 employers of 10K strong hiring initiative. In case you're unfamiliar with it, the initiative is an effort to hire 10,000 veterans in Los Angeles County by 2017. A downtown mural commissioned by a popular rock band will stay up after L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti intervened. But as Gil Reyes reports, the artwork's long-term future remains uncertain. The musicians behind this radio-friendly tune are now generating a different type of buzz on the street, specifically around Los Angeles and 6th Streets in downtown, where this painting, set up by the rock band Foster the People, is stirring controversy over the city's mural laws. This mural is a large-scale version of the band's album cover. It's a beautiful painting. I mean, I think it should stay. Because it's really nice looking and like somebody put a lot of work into it. It says a lot. It says a lot. If you look at it, it just, it's artistic. So as you can see, the reaction out here has been generally positive. Still, this mural faces a number of problems. First, it may be considered too large by the city. Second, it never received a city-issued permit. And third, it is regarded as advertisement. Still, LA Mayor Eric Garcetti is working with all parties involved to keep this mural up. The mayor has at least temporarily reversed the city's decision to take down the mural after an online petition from the band's fans gathered nearly 12,000 signatures. The mural, a 125 by 150 foot painting that went up in January, may go down anyway if compromises aren't reached. We're working with the building owner and with the muralists and the band to see what we can do to potentially keep that there and we, we got a cooling off period um, that has allowed the mural to stay up. The building owner um, also has some decision making power on his own of whether he wants to keep that there um, and there's a lot of First Amendment law that dictates, you know, is something an ad or is it just some, a piece of art? So we're going to do whatever we can to facilitate. Though the album's title, Supermodel, is displayed, no one on the street seems to mind what some are calling an advertisement. I think it should stay because it brings a lot of life to L.A., to Los Angeles downtown. Near 6th and Los Angeles streets in downtown, Gil Reyes for L.A. This Week. The band's frontman, Mark Foster, lives in downtown. He calls the work, quote, our contribution to the city of Los Angeles, our kiss of color to the city we love. A manhunt is on for child predators in Southern California. The investigation is part of a nationwide operation. Anna Marcos has more on Operation Broken Heart. Child predators have a bigger playground than ever before, and it continues to grow because it has no borders. We're talking about the Internet. Southern California's Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force just finished a month-long crackdown called Operation Broken Heart, 
which helped arrest more than 275 child predators. Allowing your child to go on the internet or social media unsupervised is like letting them walk down a dark alley in the middle of the night in a bad part of town. The LA Regional Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force is one of 62 across the country, a team effort by Homeland Security and local law agencies to tackle a problem that has gone international. It includes child exploitation, child prostitution, sex trafficking, child pornography and sex tourism, going to another country to engage in sex with children. All of it is made easier by the internet. They're luring the children away from home. The children are drugged, they're raped, they're, they're oftentimes put into a, a situation where they're sex trafficked. Investigators say the problem is too big for them alone and that parents must play an important role in stopping it. Monitor your child's internet use and do a search history on websites your child visits. Have conversations with your child about sex predators on the internet. If you do see inappropriate material, alert authorities. To young people who may be watching, I make this appeal. If someone you're interacting with online or over social media does something that makes you feel uncomfortable, tell a trusted adult immediately. Don't be embarrassed or ashamed. It's not your fault. Recent arrests included a teacher's assistant for special needs children, a retired L.A. County Sheriff, a U.S. Army soldier, and an attorney, which means tackling the problem will require vigilance from parents, children, and law enforcement alike. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. Research shows one in 25 children has interacted with predators on the Internet. A historical bridge in downtown L.A. is getting more than a facelift. It's getting a whole new look. Rasha Goel has more on the ambitious plan that will remove the iconic bridge, only to build another in its place. You may recognize this iconic bridge from movies and television, but it won't be around for long. The historic L.A. River Bridge, known as the 6th Street Viaduct, which connects downtown L.A. and Boyle Heights, is being demolished and replaced with a new bridge. But it hasn't been an easy decision. If we were going to bring down an iconic bridge due to concrete cancer and danger of it falling in a major seis seismic event, then what we build has to be even more iconic than the first. With the intention of being bigger and better, the $400 million project will begin construction in fall of this year. City leaders say the new bridge will not only serve as a way for people to get from point A to point B, but it will also be a destination location with pedestrian walkways, bike lanes and green space. We have such an opportunity to create a point C, which would be the river, and underneath the bridge with so much available open space that we could create some recreational areas, park space. A soccer field and a public art component are also part of the plan. Local artist Glenn Kaino, who has grown up and lived in the community, has been selected to create the bridge's art elements. I think that what we've talked about and what I'm interested in is sort of a conceptual art approach where, wherein, you know, what, what will be lasting is a narrative and a story and a, and a legend and a rumor of, of what happened at this moment of reconstruction. The new bridge will not only be aesthetically unique with a ribbon of arches design, but will also be created with road enhancements. We are implementing improved roadway geometry on the new bridge for increased traffic safety. There will be protected walkways for pedestrians and there will be dedicated lanes for bike riders on the new bridge. Old or new, the 6th Street Viaduct is one that will remain an iconic addition to L.A. skyline and the L.A. River. In downtown Los Angeles, I'm Rasha Goel for L.A. This Week. The existing viaduct is being replaced due to concerns that it may not hold up in the face of a serious quake due to cracks in its structure. The new bridge is expected to open by 2019. And staying on the topic of earthquake safety, a new partnership is hoping to get L.A. better prepared when disaster strikes. Yannick Hay reports on our city's selection as a resilient city. Just like any major global city, Los Angeles has its share of challenges and the biggest ones include earthquakes, drought and fires. But now the city is looking to become more resilient in the face of these disasters. It is us doing these things right that will strengthen our city and not vice versa. It is us thinking ahead that will get us to a point where we can say, well, we can't prevent disaster from happening. We can be better prepared. We can be better prepared to prevent the damage that may come when it visits us. 
We may be better prepared to be able to recover and rebuild. The city held a resilience workshop at City Hall after it was chosen by the Rockefeller Foundation to be part of its 100 Resilient Cities initiative. Out of 372 applications, Los Angeles was one of the 32 cities that was chosen by the foundation to help address issues and make it more resilient. The foundation works with cities to help them become better able to respond to adverse and unexpected events through collaboration, resources and planning. We chose cities where there were, were problems and had a broad view of working together, but we also chose cities where there was capacity to do it. Uh, because really we want success to build on success here. We want cities uh, who are not in the network to begin to look at what's going on in 100 Resilient Cities and to replicate that. Berkowitz said 100 Resilient Cities also chose Los Angeles based on strong mayoral leadership. And when it comes to Mayor Eric Garcetti, efforts are already underway to address the city's seismic safety, communications and water supply. We must reduce our reliance on imported water, increase our local storage capacity here, which is why we've established a bold goal of reducing our imported water from outside of L.A. by 50 percent by 2025 in the city. And it's goals like these that officials hope will make L.A. a model city of resilience. I'm Yana Kay for L.A. This Week. The mayor will also appoint a chief resilience officer to head up the initiative. The LA's after-school program honors a tireless leader who's set to retire after 26 years of service, Gil Reyes reports. Students from LA's best after-school program showed off the dance moves they learned during the past school year. Instead of going home immediately after class, they stuck around campus and took advantage of free after-school activities. The first time I went there, I loved it. It was it's really nice. They do arts and crafts, there's sports. This event at Skirball Cultural Center gave parents a chance to see firsthand what their children learned. Their paintings, essays, and science projects on display at this gala celebrating the program's 26th year. We know children in LA's best compared to kids not in LA's best in the same schools are 30 percent less involved in crime, 20 percent less likely to drop out. The evening also celebrated the contributions of Carla Sanger. After serving as president and CEO of LA's Best since the beginning, she's set to retire in November. Former LA Mayor Richard Reardon recalled some of the history. Mayor Tom Bradley, who was the, the predecessor mayor to me, was the one that invented the idea and started it. What started out as 10 school sites has grown to 194 campuses, serving some 28,000 kids. For helping to keep kids safe, supervised, and learning for over a quarter of a century, Sanger received this year's Children's Champion Award. It's so much less about me than it is about all the people that have worked so hard to make this program successful. That includes some 40 sponsors who paid between $500 to $100,000 to make this gala possible. At the Skirball Cultural Center, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Other LA's best honorees included the Deloitte Consulting Group and the Ella Fitzgerald Charitable Foundation. The mayor warns motorists to stay away as the Century Crunch Project gets underway near LAX, celebrating a milestone in the mayor's higher LA program and LADWP customers being urged to save water. These stories and more in City Beat. Mayor Eric Garcetti has recorded this public service announcement posted on YouTube, raising awareness about the upcoming demolition operation on Century Boulevard that will require street closures during the weekend of July 25th to the 28th. Because we planned ahead, Carmageddon never happened on the 405. So let's plan ahead again. Avoid the area if you do not need to be there. And if you must, allow for extra travel time and use public transit. A portion of Century Boulevard by Aviation, a major artery leading into the heart of LAX, will be closed for 57 hours that weekend as an old railroad bridge is demolished to make room for building a light rail aerial station for the new Crenshaw LAX light rail line, now under construction. Councilmember Tom LaBonge and the Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks recently broke ground at the Van Nuys Sherman Oaks Park to transform three existing soccer fields into three new synthetic turf soccer fields. The new fields will be usable all year round and be easier to maintain. Things haven't changed much here in the 35 years since I played, but I'm so excited to see that change is finally coming to a park that is so 
near and dear to my heart, to my children. Other planned improvements include new paved walkways and new seating areas with benches. Mayor Eric Garcetti recently marked a milestone. 10,000 youth workers hired for paid summer jobs through the mayor's Hire LA's Youth Initiative. That's double the number of paid jobs to young people offered through the program last year. Youth ages 14 to 24 hired through the program will work for 120 hours over six weeks and earn $9 per hour. The heat is on as Los Angeles gears up for another hot summer following a record dry winter. This has the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power urging its customers to save water and energy to preserve these resources and to keep their bills low. The water supply from the Eastern Sierra via the Los Angeles Aqueduct is expected to be just 7% this year, the lowest in the LA Aqueduct's 100 plus year history. As a result, the LADWP needs to purchase more expensive water to meet customer demand, thereby impacting water costs beginning July 1st. For tips on how to save on water and energy, go to LADWP.com. A new route is added on the west side for the flyaway shuttle to and from LAX. Rasha Goel has more. The Los Angeles International Airport and City of Santa Monica celebrate the launch of a new flyaway bus service. With LAX being the sixth busiest airport in the world and third busiest in the U.S., LAX officials are providing passengers a convenient and cost-effective way to get to and from LAX. Last year, over a million five passengers rode the flyaways. This is going to make it at least a million six for 2014-2015 combination. We are not finished with the flyaway network. Uh, later this year, we will be adding Hollywood, and then early next year, the South Bay. The new flyaway bus will connect Santa Monica to LAX. The nonstop service will drop off and pick up passengers in front of each airline terminal. A stop is located in front of the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium on 1875 Main Street, just north of Pico Boulevard. Making it easier for tourists and to get around and easier for locals to get to LAX and reducing traffic for all of us on the 405, on Lincoln Boulevard and other congested corridors that are some of the worst not just in this city but in this country. People living here will find it's a useful way not only to get themselves to the airport but also their visitors to get their visitors here to Santa Monica and back without having to drive to the airport to pick them up. The one-way fare is $8 and children five years old and under are free. LAX officials are expecting over 100,000 passengers to use the flyaway service from Santa Monica in the first year. With the flyaway service to the airport, residents and visitors can truly enjoy the city car free. This service was be began with downtown at Union Station, has expanded and will continue to expand because it's absolutely essential to get out of gridlock that we give people choice. The new Santa Monica flyaway bus service is the fifth route offered to the airport. Lawa officials are anticipating a total of nine flyaway services by the end of 2015. I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The flyaway service began July 15th and runs from 5.45 a.m. to 11.45 p.m. daily. In this week's list of things to do, Shakespeare in the Park, drawing yourself portrait on a lemon, and film screenings. Check out the Griffith Park Shakespeare Festival when it features performances of The Taming of the Shrew on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, July 25th, 26th, and 27th from 7 to 10 p.m. at the Old Zoo in Griffith Park, which is located at 4730 Crystal Springs Drive. The Taming of the Shrew, one of Shakespeare's most loved comedies, will run in repertory with Twelfth Night through Friday, August 29th at the Old Zoo in Griffith Park. The performances are free to the public. Bring a blanket or a low back chair and dress warmly. For more information, visit ISCLA.org. Last weekends of the month at the Skirball are events held on the last Saturday and Sunday of each month featuring special performances and activities that change every month. On Saturday, July 26th, the project is Lemonade Stand with Fallen Fruit. This popular ongoing project offers each visitor a cold glass of lemonade in exchange for a self-portrait, a drawing of yourself on a lemon, and a personal story of happiness, sadness, or self-reflection. During your visit, check out the artist's specially designed fruit-inspired art wallpaper on display in Fallen Fruit of the Skirball. The Skirball is located at 2701 North Sepulveda Boulevard. 
Go to skirball.org for additional information. New Filmmakers Los Angeles invites you to attend the 2014 film screening series and after-party event on Saturday, July 26th at the AT&T Center in downtown LA. You'll have the opportunity to meet the directors of each film, the actors and other crew, and participate in a live audience Q&A. There are pre-receptions and after-parties for each program. Complimentary event parking is available at 1133 South Olive Street near AT&T Center. Visit newfilmmakersla.com for more information and to purchase tickets. And that's a look at some upcoming things to do. The Flowers and Dragon Boat races are back after taking a few years off. We're talking about the Lotus Festival, one of LA's iconic culture fests. But as Anna Marco shows us, this yearly July celebration is better than ever. A beautiful lotus harvest this year as Echo Park's time-honored Lotus Festival returns after a four-year absence. It basically represents the purity, okay, rebirth. So uh, now, as you can see, we got a new lotus are here. And a rebirth this festival certainly is. For the last several years, the lake and the festival were put on hold as the city launched a major stormwater improvement project. The project helps protect the water quality of the lake and improves flood control with Proposition O funds. But now the music, the lotus blossoms and yes, the dragon boat races are back in full swing as is the cultural entertainment. 500 performers highlighting all types of Asian cultures. The whole idea is to integrate and have a harmony with the local community so that they can appreciate different Asian, Asia Pacific culture here. Happy Lotus Festival! Happy Lotus Festival! Happy Lotus Festival! In honor of the festival's return, the city put on an opening night complete with a screening of a movie shot by students to celebrate Echo Park. It's called The Sound We See and Echo Park City Symphony. It's a really important event and I thought it was fitting to throw a party for the neighborhood for Echo Park and have an Echo Park night. Oh, how could we have gone several years without the Lotus celebrations, the Wheels of Fortune and the Snow Cones? I'm Anna Marcos for LA This Week. According to the Echo Park Historical Society, Echo Park boasts the largest lotus beds in the western U.S. And that's going to do it for this edition. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ellen Chang. A reminder that you could catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.